Like, it doesn't take them any time. We were sitting at a coffee shop. There's another person but it's kind of awkward. We don't really want them to talk to us, or maybe we do want to talk to them. It's just, the engagement is just not really, you know. They, but kids, they show up at the same place. Hey, here's someone who's not even my height, but I like you immediately, and I'm going to go play with you. And all of a sudden, they know each other's names. They're playing around with each other. It's, it's amazing. The, there's something about this sort of childlike, uh, this childlike attitude that really just gets them connected very easily. And in fact, uh, one of the other fascinating things that is sort of, it got me thinking about other things. And you may have noticed uh, kids in your life do the same thing, especially if you're parents, you'll know this. You'll get the story coming back from school. This such and such person, they're not my friend anymore. Oh, what happened? Yes, well, they did this, they said that, and they're not my friend anymore. Okay. And it's, of course, as you know, you wait a day. And then, you know, they come back. So anything happened at school? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we're friends again. And then we did this. And like, you know, they're, they're, of course, they went from not friends at all back to, oh, yeah, we're best friends forever and immediate. Like, immediate bringing back together. And it's, it's in observations about sort of this childlike nature, you end up wondering, why, why is this harder for adults? What, what is it precisely about the fact that we, we take so long to reconcile, to come back together? And of course, as we, as we think about it, as we ponder it, and as I was pondering it, and I'm not about to give the whole psychological uh, you know, uh, uh, authoritative summary of exactly why we are broken as we are. Uh, we can read the entire Bible and find new reasons for why we're broken every day. Uh, but there's something about the fact that the emotional hurt cuts a little deeper, isn't it? There's something about, uh, um, perhaps it's our memory where we remember certain things better, or maybe it's our guardedness from our woundedness in the past. Maybe it's just the lack of trust that we have built up over time, or maybe it's just we don't want to invest the emotional energy. We just know from our experience that as we gain in our uh, age and our life, somehow that w greater wisdom and experience also comes with greater sort of defensiveness and guardedness. And that's too bad because we also, th when we look, when I talk to people in their lives, in their situations, the hurts, it's this area that often causes a great amount of pain. Now, our sources of pain come from lots of areas, so I'm not about to give a hierarchy, hierarchy or what pain is greater than the other. But I think we can all agree that the pain we carry about broken relationships, lack of reconciliation, perhaps it's in our family, perhaps it's in our friends, this is something that often carries deep, deep wounds. And uh, it doesn't always come across as animosity, right? And that's also the other thing that is interesting about kids versus us. Kids sort of often wear their emotions on their sleeves, whereas for us, everything can seem fine, but it's what's bubbling under the surface. It's like a piano that's slightly off tune, like it's still playing the same song, the relationship's sort of going, but yet there's something a little bit off. And I've had recent experience with this. I'm not about to share the depths of some of the family stuff that's going on with us, some of the relational stuff that's going on with us. But I, you could tell this story as well about something that happens, some experience, where there's that disconnect, there's that brokenness. And things continue, and you might play the part of family member and connection, and yet things are not quite the same. And what I am not describing only is our relationship with humans. I'm also describing what many of us feel about God himself. I don't know if it's just the pandemic. It's certainly not just the pandemic. The pandemic has made it more difficult. But even before the pandemic, one of the things that's striking to me as a pastor is sort of the epidemic of distance from God that we were feeling even before the epidemic of this coronavirus. It's one of those things, it's like that piano that's just slightly off tune, like many of us are here, and I am not accusing us of lack of genuineness. I don't, I'm not here to give some sort of sermon about God smiting us for our inauthenticity. And yet, there is still something about, and, and if this is not you, praise God, but I'm talking about the many, many other people who, and conversations, and I will admit, I will admit, in my case as well, it can be difficult to walk through life and to always experience that closeness with God. I mean, just the pandemic alone, 
is, was, was causing me, oh, my own stress and weight, but just pastoring in general, just the things that I'm doing. It, it has that weird sort of dynamic of, yeah, I'm professionally Christian on the one hand, and yet perhaps it's a mystery to some, but certainly for those of us who serve in ministry, as we're well aware of the fact that it, there's not necessarily a one-to-one sort of, oh, I'm leading and... and, and um, praying from the front and helping people discover and teach, and yet I'm feeling close to God. And again, I'm not trying to say that we're all sort of being disingenuous, because there is something to be said for proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming Jesus. I'm not proclaiming my connection with God. I'm not proclaiming my ability to connect with him. I'm proclaiming the one who I know and am yet still pursuing. But there is something about that. There is this epidemic out there of feeling distant from God. And the news is still the same, just like, you know, just like that piano that's just a little off-key and the song still plays, and yet uh, the news is not different. We know, we know in our head the good news of Jesus, and I hope you all do too. We, I hope you know that God is not, in fact, distant from us. That, in fact, the very good news is that even God and his mightiness, for as... Um, as logically consistent as would be for some being that's so holy, so wonderful, so awesome to want nothing to do with the ants that we basically are in comparison with him. He humbled himself. And not only humbled himself, he put himself on a cross. He died a ferocious and horrible death for you, for me, for love, for love is humanity. And it wasn't just then, because one thing that I would hope that we all come to understand more and more as we grow in depth of knowledge of him, that the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, tells the testimony of God's love for us. It's this often typecast thing where unfortunately many of us have a hard time seeing the love of God in the, in the Old Testament, but it's been there the entire time. He is the one and the same God, oh, never changing forever. And he's always been there for, for us. And yet... The distance between our head and our heart is often so, so distant. And we feel that disconnect. We feel that um, lack of connection. And, and just as it goes with human relationships, it also goes with us. So how do we get ourselves unstuck? Because we have found ourselves stuck both individually and also collectively. This is something we carry as a church. I'm not just talking to us as individuals. This is not a, a message about you have to yourself get yourself on the right path on your own. We bear the responsibility with one another. We are a church. We are a family. We are there for one another. And there's sort of a collective distance that gets, um, uh, that gets sort of shared by all of us. And again, I'm not trying to say that there's some sort of judgment per se coming to it. But what I'm saying is people of God, we have a God who is loving and there for us and connected to us. And if it's indeed the case that this is something that we're suffering in silence and we're not feeling like we're kind of able to kind of share this because I don't know what it would mean for me to share that I'm feeling a little distant from God. Well, if we could get ourselves to actually bring that out, perhaps the healing can begin. And indeed, that is precisely where this message is going. Because we have been building all this time. We've been building prayer. We've been building worship. Indeed, Jack's sermon last week was all about building uh, that ability to confront the powers of darkness that work against us. And this indeed is actually sort of a, would be a continuation of that theme. Because there is that darkness that weighs over us, convincing us, sort of convincing us, or at least could distracting us from the good news that God is there present with us. Um, and the way that we build that together is through confession and repentance. Build through confession and repentance. We, um, we read this passage, or uh, we read this passage together. Mary, thank you so much for reading that. And she was a trooper. I changed it at the last minute. <laughs> I was called her last night. <laughs> the scripture's changing. Change everything. Um, because the whole book, it's, it's hard to select these kinds of things because this theme is through the entire thing. And that's one of the disadvantages of preaching these things section by section because you almost want to look at the whole thing and go, okay, let's start from the beginning, Ezra chapter 1. Let's go all the way to end. Let's pick out every single thing. We'd be here for five hours. But I'll, I'll give you the shorter version. So, uh, it, it com- so one of the ways it comes out in this chapter 9, and we've read it already, and so if you, we're going to be diving into this a little bit. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open it up again to Nehemiah chapter 9. And what did we read? 
what was the thing that, just to summarize what, we, where we, what Mary kind of helped us read and understand. It started with the Israelites gathering together for confession. They put on sackcloth. They put on dust on their heads. And they spent a long amount of time confessing and reading scripture. And then what followed was sort of this a uh, collective confession or report that they sort of gave, this prayer that they gave to God. And they began with a sort of a story about kind of where they've arrived so far, the story of what God has done so far, and it ended with a confession. And I actually want to, before we dive into it a little bit deeper, I want to kind of observe that on a high level. Because before we even get to confession of re- and repentance, and this is kind of my computery background showing, when you're, when you're dealing with computers, often you don't start counting from one, you start counting from zero. <laughs> so we're going to so we're gonna still go step zero. This is not step one. This is the step before step one. This is before we even start with confession re- confession and repentance. We have to start with willingness. Because if we can imagine that... Make it, let's help ourselves make it more concrete because sometimes working with God is a little bit abstract. Let's imagine that individual, that human being that you might be in conflict right now or if you're not in conflict with anyone right now and you have perfectly situated every single one of your relationships right now, just imagine in the past or your friend who might be in conflict with some. Imagine what, what, what might be necessary. And, and one thing I want to state up the bat, this is not a message about forgiveness. <laughs> We've already preached on that back in November 22nd of 2020. You can look back on that sermon, and there's all sorts of good stuff. And the preacher is amazing. He was, he was, he was fantastic. Uh, it was me. <laughs> um, great. T- so, uh, but uh, I dive deeply into in forgiveness there. So let's sort of assume for the sake of this that we have arrived at a place where we are even willing. And let's even, let's even mold that, like sort of envelop that into this willingness because forgiveness, that whole thing, which is indeed its own battle, and we've talked about how forgiveness, there's a, those are its own ba- barriers, because sometimes we think forgiveness is sort of saying it's okay. Sometimes we think forgiveness means we have to be re-hurt by the person. It's none of that. And yet we are compelled uh, through very strong words from Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 that, confession, that forgiveness is necessary. But refer back to that sermon. What, would, what, what might you imagine that would need to happen from your standpoint, given that your heart is willing to do so, what would you expect to happen in order for that reconciliation to happen? Well, first thing you'd want to at least be aware of is that per- this other person is willing as well. You know, it, that's one of the difficult things, too, about like adult mind versus kid mind, right? Like, kid isn't sort of aware that there's this sort of this ability for the grudges to kind of hold up, but we, we have that ability. And so we have the unfortunate a problem of knowing too much about human nature. And so when we engage in uh, perhaps the, the discipline or the practice of reconciliation with someone, we may not be know, know exactly what's going to come back. And of course, the same thing happens with us and God. And I'm using these as in parallel because confession with others and humans is also the same with God. Is in our, we in fact, going to have someone willing to come back with and reconcile with us. And so that is precisely the story that, whoa, that is precisely the story that the Israelites are telling in this. Let's dive into uh, the the second half of chapter, of verse 5 in chapter 9. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are Lord. You made the heavens and even the highest heavens and all their starry host and earth and all that is on it, the seas and all in them. You gave life to everything in the multitudes in heaven in, of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who's a, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abram. You found, you found his faith, heart faithful to you. You made a covenant with him and you gave to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Gergesites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. And it goes on from there. We kind of skipped over a bit in the reading, but I would encourage you to read this on your own as your own sort of spiritual practice to, to remember the faithfulness of God. They are bringing the story all the way back and reminding us that if there's any sort of feeling of distance between me and God, that we can found ourselves on the fact that God has already been doing the work, the hard, hard work of cross centuries, millennia, to bring himself close to us. Because that's one of the first lies that sort of sets in. 
I know a lot of us recognize. When there's distance between us and God, it can be very easy to convince ourselves, well, that I am, you know, Paul was adorable, but he is not the worst of all sinners. I am the worst of all sinners. I can't possibly be worthy of his love, of his forgiveness. Have, have you read the Old Testament? Have you read the things that the people of God did collectively, the practices they practice in over generations? Like, and, 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 and I'm not trying to minimize the true feeling of distance, but this is where the beginning point is sort of this recognition of willingness on God's part. He has gone through generations. And he indeed, as you know, skipping a little bit ahead to verse uh, 17, you can see, I'm sorry to skip you ahead a little bit, but in verse 17, it invokes uh, the character of God. You are forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Uh, pointing to Exodus 34, where God first stated, this is who he is, this is his character. Foreshadowing the years and the centuries and the millennia of unfaithfulness, and yet God is still at our heels, looking to save us. That song uh, that was sung, Great Are You, Lord, You Are Life, You Are Love, that we sung, You Bring Light to the Darkness, just that, great, that God is great in all places. What an amazing reminder for that. The song called uh, Reckless Love that many of us know, it sings this, this song, invokes the story of the Jesus or the shepherd leaving the 99 and going after the one. You, we know these things, and so we have to be reminded of this, and this is where they're beginning. They're beginning reminding themselves of the faithfulness, of the, God's ability to reconcile with them. But that has to go in reverse, because the thing that we have to recognize as we look into this theme of confession and repentance, is it's not just about the other. We have to ask, ask, the, ask, ask the question, what about us? You know, and this is going to overlap a little bit of the forgiveness thing, but sometimes we have to work on our willingness to move forward towards somebody, towards our willingness to, to, uh, to, to step forward into this reconciliation process. Because at the very heart of a relationship with God is this recognition that we are not the most important. And that is a difficult hurdle for many of us to, 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 to overcome. To the, the first step of our willingness to step back to God is to also recognize that we are not necessarily going to get everything that we want the way that we want it. It's this recognition that, that we have to sacrifice a little bit of ourselves in order to kind of find this middle ground. And this doesn't just have to do with God. I would implore you to consider this in your own personal relationships. A lot of times, that distance between us, is in, between me and the other, is not just simply because we are so easily convinced that it's all on them. I mean, I certainly have been there. How many of us, when we're in conflict, have found our, some way to convince us, well, it's all sort of their fault? And yet we have to remember and be reminded from God that we have to take that initial step of willingness. Will we respond to this, 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 this epic of God's faithfulness with our willingness to step forward to him and to reconnect with him? Because that's not going to be done passively. And this is where a little bit of the hard work comes. Because sometimes we feel like we are, we are lulled into the sense that we can just kind of sit back and uh, allow it to all happen. This takes work, this takes effort, this takes spiritual practices and disciplines, this takes sometimes even daily practices, active practices, not just sitting and waiting on this happen, but we might have to turn to God actively in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order to get started on that. But let's move on to the second point, and then we're still, we're still not even at point one yet, we're at point zero point one. We've just gone up a tenth of a level, we're not yet at confession. Because there's one more level of willingness, and this is there, the willingness word is still there, but I felt like this was enough of a point to kind of that, that is worth its own um, worth its own time. Willingness to honor the relationship. You know, you can imagine imagine if it was a married couple seeking to reconcile, and they were both willing. They were both willing to approach one another, but one of the people said, "Okay, I'm going to still." reconcile with you, but, what I, but, but I, what I want to happen at the end is to still have the ability to kind of fraternize around with other people, with other people of the opposite sex. And of course, on the surface, you're just like, no, 
The marriage covenant is a covenant of exclusivity between a man and a woman. You, you can't do that. You, you can't say you're willing to approach them, but say that the terms of a relationship are going to change. In the same way, this is how we understand chapter 9, verse 2. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this can be a very distracting point for us. Chapter 9, verse 2 says, Those of Israel's descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. This invokes something that is a very sticky point, and, and I was thinking about just kind of, avoid, like kind of glossing over it entirely, but I, I think it is our job as preachers to help train you, equip you for understanding the Bible. Um, there's a section in this Ezra Nehemiah passage back in Ezra chapter 9 and 10. At the very end of Ezra, there is a large amount of time being spent with this, and, and you may have read on your own, if you're doing your own reading, you may have stumbled across it and felt very, very confused, because in chapters 9 and 10 of Ezra, which is, of course, you know, we're doing Ezra and Nehemiah together. It's, kind of, it's the same story, Ezra and Nehemiah, about people coming back from, uh, coming back from exile. Uh, a lot of sort of negative words being said about people who have married foreign wives. And I want us to understand, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I don't want to get distracted away, but I want to mention it because I want to help us understand what's at the heart of this. Without going into the deep, deep, deep theology of this, because, we, again, this could be a five-hour sermon, Understand what's at stake for God in this. When it's making the emphasis that those of Israel's descent had separated themselves from the foreigners, and when there's sort of this negativity associated with being attached with foreigners' wives, you have to look back all the way at De Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 7, there is a command that says, do not marry foreign, wi foreign, foreign wives or foreign husbands and wives. And there's a specific reason given for that. And, and hopefully you can understand God's, what's at stake in, with God for this. In chapter, I don't, don't have to turn to it, but Deuteronomy 7, starting in verse 3, it says, um, Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters and sons to take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This goes all the way back to even just Exodus chapter 19. We know the story of Exodus chapter 19 where this covenant was being established. And in Exodus chapter 19, what was the deal or the covenant, the relationship that God was trying to establish with, with his people? Um, it go, God says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, 4, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you uh, to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant... Then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God, at the very beginning of this whole thing, the reason why this is, is not to establish some sort of arbitrary set of rules. We have to understand the whole story in context. God was establishing a people that had a special relationship with him. The, because of what happened at the fall, we, an unholy, human, sort of sinful people, could not be in the presence of God's glory. And so what God did is he established the good set of commandments, the good law, in order to reconnect humanity and God together again. But God had certain sort of strict rules about that because his holiness is no joke. His purity is no joke. It's nothing than passive. God takes his own holiness, his own goodness, very seriously in the same way that we want God to take seriously all the evil out there in the world. If, God, if we're going to have any hope in, in, in facing any of the evil out there, we rely upon a holy God who has a purity and life and goodness and wholeness in him. And so he established this, uh, this very particular relationship. And the one thing that he wanted for us is to almost be kind of married to us, to be connected to us in covenant. And the problem with intermarrying was, and, and he said this would happen, and it indeed yet did happen. It's funny how God sometimes warns us that, well, this is going to happen, and, and it happens that way. It was, it was exactly that sort of intermixing with the culture that brought them away from God. It was, it was sort of a way that sort of sh channeled their departure away from their attitude and closeness with God. And now, so I want to be clear about that as we go into this. God has been made it very clear in other passages of Scripture that divorce, sent, just simply sending people away, even if they're non-believers, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 makes this clear. You don't just simply get rid of people if you've established a lifelong covenant. You don't just simply get rid of them because they are unbelievers. And yet, God uh, still uh, gives us the responsibility of being close to him. 
I, in one way, he's going to say, well, it's just, it's fine. It, it, it is what it is, but you now have a job to do. <laughs> is you are now going to have, going to have a more difficult time to be connected and devoted because you are, you have that sort of influence sort of driving you away. And of course, many of you are in this situation. Many of you have friends and family. Many of you are personally in this situation. And I know this is at risk of bringing up very deep things. And again, I, I really hope that I'm not coming across as any sort of condemnation or anything. Because God wants you to be faithful to your husband, your wife. God wants you to be faithful to that person. And yet the thing that we all bear responsibility to do is be connected to God first. To be connected to him first. Because that is indeed the relationship that we need to have that willingness to honor the relationship with God, whatever we do. And it isn't just about husbands and wives and marrying. It, it's about our jobs. You might be working in a particular industry that has a particular, and so to bring it out of that one particular example, I'm going to hit the rest of you. You might be working at a particular industry where certain sins are more manifest. It's kind of a culture of what's going on. You have a responsibility. Because again, what God is talking about is a very insular community. We are now beyond that where we, the Gentiles, the non-Israelites, have been invited into the covenant. But there's a huge responsibility on us. Because in a way, it's a lot easier to establish, to, to follow God, when you're sort of in this tight-knit community with a lot of strict rules on how to obey God. We now all have responsibilities. So let's not just put it to who we're, uh, who we're in relationship with. What, what, what are you inviting into your home? What kind of friends or relations are you inviting into your home? What kind of close connections? With whom are you putting your trust? What sort of attitudes are you bringing up from your culture, from your friends, from your workplaces? How are you honoring the relationship with God that, you, that our relationship with him is exclusive? So, and so, I, so that is sort of the second sort of pre-point before that. We need to have that willingness to sort of approach that. But even so, even with that willingness, we know that we find ourselves often stuck. And so which just brings us to the next point, confession. Now this is where it gets a little difficult reading things from the scriptures. Because this is where the scriptures don't add any sort of emotion or... It's tough to know what the motivations are. And when we read passages like this, it's, it's, it's hard for us to know, are they, tr are they truly confessing? Like, they're saying the right words, and they're spending a lot of time doing it. But are they, are they true in this confession? Were these just words, or is this genuine? And, and, and the thing is, we don't get to know. This is simply a, something in Scripture that gets to be modeled for us. We get to be shown what it, what it looks like, perhaps, on the outside to confess, but only God knows what's in our hearts. And we know time and time again from Scripture that God does not uh, look at us for the things that we do on the outside. As it says in uh, Psalm 54... 51, uh, chapter 16, 50, Psalm 51, 16, it says, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. God honors the inclination of our heart uh, and how we honor him. So it's not just simply about the words. So take this and let's not look too deeply into their motivation, but let's take this as a model of what we can do. They went all out. They had a community that had years and years and years of sin, and they went to great lengths, more than just simply a simple prayer in the middle of a worship service. Look at what they were doing. They were fasting. How many of us have ever fasted because of the, the deep remorse or, con or confession that we want to bring to God? Wearing sackcloth and putting dust on our heads. That was a cultural practice of a t at the time to uh, show that they were sort of completely contrite, completely humble. We are not worthy. We don't have to adopt that practice. But what practices do we have in our community? What practices can we adopt? And, and not that adopting all cultural practices are bad. There are certain things from the world that we can sort of reform for the good of our uh, for the, our relationship with God. How can we demonstrate outwardly that we are, and it's not about just simply saying sorry, 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 uh, so that you know, it's a number of sorries that makes us connected to God. Because confession, as I put up there, is an antidote to two things. It's an antidote to selflessness, selfishness, but also an antidote to guilt. So often as we are confessing, what we, in any situation, we're talking with humans or with God, we inadvertently put ourselves in a position sort of above and or below the person that we are confessing to. 
The first one attitude we could have is sort of defensiveness or selfishness. To kind of just simply kind of give an account. Oh, just explain. Well, I was, oh yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really sorry about this, but really what I was doing was, if you could only understand the situation, or if you could just understand my experience, then you would, just, then you would not be sad about this or upset about this. And I know we know how that feels from when it's given to us. It's like, you're not actually sorry. You're just giving the account of what you did. And you're just trying to explain it away. In a way, it kind of amplifies that sort of tendency towards selfishness, that it's about me and saving my ego, but I'm not going to actually humble myself and confess and actually show confession. So we're kind of inadvertently putting ourselves above. But there's also a way in which confession can be uh, bringing us below, which is what I was kind of just referring to. We might think that because we are so unworthy or we're so ridden with guilt, we just have to say, sorry, 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 like almost like it is not enough. That we've been an endless fount of sorries in order so that God will somehow bring us back. Coming from that sort of lack of confidence that we have that God is willing to come back with us. And yet, what do we learn from Scripture, from Exodus 19? He wants to be partners with us. He wants to make us a holy nation. He wants to be on an equal playing field. So for us, confession, genuine confession, saying, God, here is what I did. And I am so, so sorry. And I want to maintain that relationship. And I'm going to live in the confidence that, as the Israelites did, they laid out all the different ways that they know that God is faithful. And that God will indeed honor the sacrifice, their sacrifice of, of confession. But yet they still did do the work of listing all the different ways that their people had uh, sinned over the years. Just look at the, all the various ways. In verse 16, they says, we've been arrogant, stiff-necked, did not obey commands. Verse 17, refused to listen, failed to remember miracles, rebelled. Verse 26, disobedient, rebelled again, blasphemies, killed prophets. Verse 28, verse 29, verse 30, paid no attention to God. Verse 33, act wickedly. They're going, they're listing on and on and on the ways we confess. Not in a way to say, oh, we're just simply explaining away what did. There's nothing that explaining. They said, we genuinely did this and we're sorry. And yet they're not simply uh, losing themselves in the confession so that they feel like it's not going to even be enough after they do it. There's this confidence that you are indeed a God, as I read in verse 17, but you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And so how do we model that ourselves? How do we come to God and to one another in a spirit of confessing, confessing authentically what we have done and done that together. What practice, how can we model what is being done in these scriptures where they took days, hours, a quarter of the day spent in confession? I'm not suggesting that this is going to lay out, I'm not suggesting a program for a day-long kind of thing. I'm just uh, opening ourselves to the imagination of how we can make it so that our confession is more than just this trite, simple thing, but truly own to God the ways in which we have fallen away. And then finally, repentance. This is one of those churchy words. And so many of us may already know, and I'll help us all understand, that the word repentance just simply comes from the Greek word to turn around, metanoia. It's just it's, you're simply turning, you're turning. It's a metaphor to help us think about moving back towards God. We're walking away from God, and by repenting, we're moving back towards. And the thing about repentance is that it, it's also a very sticky thing, because oftentimes... Um, we get hung up on that wondering whether or not the repentance will stick. And again, this is another way in which we sort of forget the graciousness and love of God. This is one way we sort of mischaracterize the, God's relationship, especially with the Israelites. It's often mischaracterized that what God wanted from the Israelites was perfection. And that, oh, well, because they couldn't do everything perfectly, well, that's why we needed Jesus. No. God established the law as an antidote for the fact that he knew that they would sin. That's where there's all these rituals. That's why this, the Yom, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He knew that there was going to be this continual sort of trying and attempting to do the law correctly, but then failure. The difference is what he uh, was uh, largely upset about was not the extent to which they were sinning, was the extent to which they didn't care. They just didn't care to even turn back. The, the rituals and practice were put in there. It's like very specific things. You don't even think, need to think about it. Here's the rule. Here's the thing you need to do. Just do this thing. You don't need to even just have this sort of giant sort of apology video that goes viral on TikTok. 
You just simply need to go through the practice and I, you rely on God's holiness to restore you, to, allow, to rely on God's goodness and graciousness and forgiveness in order to bring you back together. And yet, even with that very specific, very, in a way, easy way to kind of have that way, because God did all the work to establish that connection, it was, it wasn't, there was not even that desire, there was that desire to go after other gods, to have put one's emotional stock in other places. And so when I'm talking about repentance, I want, to hear, want you to hear me clearly. We're not talking about doing everything perfectly. When I say we are going to turn back to God, that when I'm, I'm saying, not, what I'm not saying is the, the holy grail for us, the ultimate sort of expression of our godliness is us as a church and individually being perfect. That we never sin, that we never fight, that we never have an argument together, that we never put together a document of proposals that people argue about. That we never have some sort of conflict within the church. That there's never some sort of thing that happens. We can't promise that. All we can promise is we are going to adopt a, a care for our relationship with one another. That when those times come, we genuinely desire to come back together. That's what repentance is all about. It's not about living, if worrying that, yet yeah, we're going to promise all. Because they did promise these things. And you can take this to your own reading. You can see in chapter 10 of Nehemiah... The, it's headed in the NIV, the agreement of the people, and all the different ways they're going to restore uh, what they, you know, what they're going to do. And you read just a few chapters later, which is slightly stealing the thunder of someone else in a later series here, but it, it doesn't quite take. But again, it, the, the, the main problem is not that we make promises or repentance and it doesn't take. The main thing is that we end up just not caring. We not end up going through the process. We end up not going back to that process of confession and bringing ourselves back to God. That we just simply live in and allow ourselves to sit in that sin, sit in that disconnection with God and not actually take actions in order to restore. And I'm not saying it's all on you either. You might be thinking, okay, well now my disconnection with God, the thing, the problem that we were exploring from the beginning, this is all my fault and I need to restore it. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that yes, there may be, that God has brought himself to you. And yes, there may be opportunities if we allow ourselves to be quiet in our soul and to hear what God is saying to us through our community, through worship, through preaching, through scripture, there might be invitations that God is offering to you to put yourself in a position where you step ever so slightly back to him. He is not looking for you to do it perfectly. He is, he is going to expect, probably, that you're going to fail again. And not that that's okay, because, again, what we're talking about is a system whereby we honor the fact that sin is a problem, and we confess it properly and authentically, and yet we still live in the grace and the knowledge that our Father is one who is gracious and loving and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So what does that mean for us, Queensway? What do we have to confess? What will we do to repent? We've already come on a, a good way on the process. Many of you remember we went through this process and you missed it. Oh boy, was it a powerful evening when we all got together and sort of confessed many different ways in which we have wronged one another. We've already gone on the journey and we're doing well. But the warning for us is to not simply rest on our laurels. To not rest on the fact, well, we did this in the past... And so now we're good. What is being rep demonstrated to us in this scripture is a need to continually be in repentance. It's a warning. It's a warning that if a people stops the ongoing process of confession and repentance, that they get themselves to a place where they might be in exile. And God is still faithful to bring you back. But let us reorientate ourselves in what we desire. Do we not desire a loving continual relationship with our God? Do we not desire the kingdom of God in our lives and to be renewed and restored by the loving, healing power of his grace, his truth, and his love? Is this not what is our desire? Because it's God's desire as well. And so let's take this moment in our day today as we reflect on what God might be saying to you and the ways in which God might be inviting you back to hear from God. What do we have to confess, both collectively and individually? And what will we do to repent?